Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. Always a different energy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On today's show, the January 6th committee airs another episode of Insurrection after some new testimony. President Biden announces new steps to protect abortion access amid criticism of the White House response to Dobbs. And Chief Take Officer Elijah Cohn is back for another episode of Take Appreciators. Uh, all right. The January 6th committee is back this week with a brand new episode of Insurrection on Tuesday. Uh, This episode will focus on Trump's connection to violent extremist groups like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, specifically his December 19th tweet that said, quote, big protest in D.C. on January 6th. Be there. We'll be wild. Uh, On Friday, the committee finally interviewed former White House counsel Pat Cipollone behind closed doors. And over the weekend, they got a surprise offer of testimony from the host of the War Room podcast, Stephen K. Bannon, uh, who didn't have the best day in court on Monday during the pretrial hearing uh, on his contempt of Congress charges. Maybe we should start there. Um, Tommy, how'd Bannon's hearing go? And uh, what's with the change of heart on his decision to testify? What, what's he up to here? Yeah, Steve, um, my mentor, my future co-host. What's been going on in the War Room? Fill he had a bad in. day. I, I haven't listened in a minute. I got to get back. I mean, so he had a bad day in court. <laughs> Uh, Steve's, uh, I call him Steve E, but Steve's critical, his criminal contempt hearing will not be delayed beyond uh, July 18th. Steve wanted it delayed because the jury pool would be tainted by the publicity in his legal view. The judge ruled against that. They ruled against his motion to subpoena House Democrats. Uh, Bannon cannot argue to the jury that he doesn't have to comply with the January 6th committee because the committee wasn't imp- was improperly put together. I think that was a novel legal argument they were yeah, putting forward. Yeah, Mary on that one. The uh, judge called uh, the last minute offer to testify a last ditch attempt to avoid accountability. Um, basically Steve's only defense is to argue that he didn't understand the deadlines to the point where his exasperated lawyer was basically like, well, what's the point of going to trial if I have no defenses available to me? (laughs) Best crime of the day. Probably not something you want to hear your lawyer say. So yeah, no, it it was pretty bad. How are we supposed to go to trial if we don't have any defense left? Um, so the justice department, uh, (laughs) we just made an edit. Uh, so there was also a justice department court filing related to Bannon's contempt uh, contempt case uh, that came out on Monday that revealed that uh, the DOJ interviewed Donald Trump's attorney, Justin Clark, two weeks ago. What's that about? Garland finally about to get him? No. No. (laughs) No, it was literally, I think, just about what they told Steve Bannon. And it seems like what Trump's lawyer said is, we never told them that that there was executive privilege for what Steve Bannon said, which is interesting, right? Because they've been making obscene completely ridiculous claims about what executive privilege is or means this whole time. But for whatever reason, they chose on this to not help their boy Steve out. This is genuinely confusing. So there's a letter from October 6th. Clark instructed Bannon to, quote, where appropriate, invoke any immunities and privileges he may have from compelled testimony in response to the subpoena. He also told Bannon not to produce any privileged documents or testimony. Bannon's lawyers say, they were like, what does that mean? What, what, like, give us more clarity on what specifically was privileged. But then Trump's lawyers didn't offer anymore. So my cynical hat take on this is that that seems very convenient for everybody involved. Steve Bannon's like, oh, I was told everything was privileges, so I can't talk. Trump got a key witness to shut up. But now Trump's lawyer is throwing Bannon's lawyer under the bus. Bannon's guy is pissed. Um, So it's a total mess. Well, I think as a lawyer, he can't, as a lawyer, he can't be on the record telling someone to do something that isn't like that, like he can't give legal advice that isn't based in the law. He can't say this is executive. Privilege. Yeah, I mean, the Trump's lawyer is saying, like, look, we certainly didn't say you had immunity from testifying. Right. Sounds like Steve Bannon is going to testify. Well, and and I mean, I, I was worried when I first saw this that this was some this was some stunt where Bannon just wanted to like you know t- talk on TV because yeah, everybody <laughs> thought this was going to be like his messaging. Gonna, but like clearly the January, on, yeah, no, the, the, that Liz, stupid? Liz isn't going to let that first happen. Rodeo. <laughs> you think Liz, you think you think Liz woke up? This is Liz woke up today for the first time. This is Liz Cheney we're talking about. All right, she's going to save this goddamn country. All right. <laughs> But uh, it's also, yeah, they're not going to put Ben in front of, Bannon's going to, if Bannon's going to do something behind closed doors first, but it's also funny because it's like Bannon, like right before his trial begins, is like, actually, I, I take back my crime. I take back my crime. Like, was, he, like he's driving back to the bank to put the money back. Well, that's that, not how it works. Yeah, the prosecutors made that case in court today. They're like, J- no, you don't get to get rid of the contempt charges just because now you offer to testify. You already committed the crime. <laughs> that's not how it works. You didn't answer the subpoena. You didn't answer the subpoena. 
Uh, just what did you forget? Yeah, that, well, that's that's, that's his what, last defense. Well, that's, what, last, that, that's, that's what the lawyer, the lawyer, yeah, literally his last okay. defense is it's, it's an oopsie doopsie. Oops. Misdemeanor charges are punishable by at least thirty days or up to one year in prison upon conviction. I think there's two charges. There might be like up to a hundred thousand dollar fine. I mean, it's just what, what's what's just pure justice about this whole thing is uh, he he may get uh, <laughs> he may be guilty for contempt. And then he also is going to testify. <laughs> well, he's gonna, they're going to get the testimony anyway. John, judging by my uh, viewing of the movie Double Jeopardy, couldn't you just do the time and then not testify? Like, what happens then? I think. Well, I don't know. I think. I think he's making. I don't know. We'll see. Well, if I they suggest somewhere, you uh, stream Double Jeopardy. Yeah, somewhere okay, the host is strict scrutiny. You're just like cringing. <laughs> yeah, you know, just, like, like, just, like, just fucking Jesus. ask us for t- two thirty seconds. Look just give us a call. Just bunch of idiots. bunch of one L dipshits. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. You guys are very smart. We're not. Um, uh, speaking of closed door testimony, uh, Cipollone met with the committee for eight hours on Friday. Uh, love it. What do we know about what they got out of him? First thing, uh, one thing to note, uh, this has been noted on Twitter, which I think is important. Uh, the closed captioning doesn't know how to spell uh, Pat Cipollone, so he's neither, often neither does it, neither do I. So it's often uh, in closed captioning as Patsy Baloney. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is really? which, uh, yeah, which is whatever that does for you. I appreciate it. I got a uh, out of it. Yeah. So he did, you know, declare certain things privileged. There are certain things he refused to testify about, but spokesman for, for the committee said that he provided critical testimony on nearly every major topic. This includes information demonstrating Donald Trump's supreme dereliction of duty. I don't care about de- dereliction of duty. I roll my eyes at dereliction of duty. The part I like <laughs> is where it says the testimony also corroborated key elements of Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony. Uh, remember that it, Cassidy Hutchinson is the one that said... Uh, uh, a couple things that she heard from Cipollone, one of which is, keep in touch with me. We're going to get charged with every crime imaginable if we make that movement happen, which is the movement Trump tried to choke out his driver uh-huh. to get done. And then she was also the one who testified that when the violence broke out, Cipollone demanded that Meadows speak to Trump to get him to try to stop it. And when when Meadows refused because Trump didn't want to do anything, Cipollone said, something needs to be done or people are going to die. The blood's going to be on your fucking hands. So this is what it seems Cipollone may have corroborated. So it seems as though Stephanie Murphy was on Meet the Press. Uh, she's a, the, one of the January 6th committee members. Uh, she's going to be leading the hearing on Tuesday. Um, she said that he didn't necessarily confirm exactly the every crimes imaginable quote um but also they've said that he didn't contradict it that's so they're all, they're all saying that's that all didn't i didn't even confirm so they, they kind of went with the like different people have different memories of similar things he did not contradict any testimony from any other witnesses he also didn't necessarily confirm every cassidy hutchinson story he doesn't need to confirm everything if you said at the fucking white house they've got us for every crime imaginable if there was, if you didn't say anything close to that, you'd be like, "I never said that's not something I said. That's right. not something I did." Like these guys, these are these are some of those memorable moments. I said moments some crimes. The, yeah. I said some crimes you might be able to imagine. There, <laughs> look, there are forgettable days at work. We've all had them. This isn't one of them. A- anyway, it's going to be the the committee said they'll be playing some of Cipollone's testimony uh, on in Tuesday's hearing. So. Can't wait. So that'll Can't be wait. good. And then uh, reportedly, we're going to get testimony from the former spokesman for the Oath Keepers. Glad I didn't take that job. And also, <laughs> one or two uh, gene- real sliding doors <laughs> moment for you. What the fuck? <laughs> it was a it was a Mark Penn contract. <laughs> <laughs> that joke is staying in. Yeah, for um, sure. Apparently, this guy was not in the Oath Keepers, but was their spokesman and, and lived with Stuart Rhodes, one of the founders of the Oath Keepers. I don't know what like, life choice, buddy. And then uh, one or two January sixth rally attendees. I'm not sure if that means like Jim Jordan and Matt Gates or just you know <laughs> just run of the mill attendees. I but, mean, yeah. What What do you think the you know a lot of people are probably listening to this episode Tuesday morning right before the hearing. Um, what do you guys think the committee's goal is for the hearing? about specifically the connection between Trump and the extremist groups. Like, you know, we already we already heard from Cass- Cassidy Hutchinson say that, like, Trump knew that some of his supporters were armed and dangerous, urged them to go to the Capitol anyway. So what more can we get from uh, from this one? It, so it sounds like so a few of the committee members were on Meet the Press or, and other shows, right? Mur- Murphy was, uh, 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 Lofgren was. Raskin was out there. Um, and what they said was we're going to connect the dots during these hearings between these groups and those who are trying in government circles to overturn the election. So it seems like this is the final piece of it. They're going to go to that meeting, uh, Team Crazy's meeting <laughs> at, was it the Willard? The Willard, the Willard yeah. Hotel on December 18th. And I think they're going to try to c- tie what they were going to do at the Capitol uh, to what the uh, uh, legal creeps were doing uh, to try to overturn the election, trying to ma- finally, that's something we've been talking about for weeks. Like, how are they going to make that connection? It seems hopefully this is a hearing where they're going to finally really try to draw that connection. Yeah, they're, they're going to say that Trump 
Uh, what's what's a uh, shofar? He blew, blew the, the, the MAGA show, shofar. He blew the MAGA, MAGA shofar. And ironically, a bunch of Nazis came to DC. Yeah, that's bad. But that's the whole point. Is that they, they say this was like a siren song to get the bad guys. And, and also, shofar isn't like a thing that calls. It's fine. It's fine. We'll let it go. Is it? I, I imagine imagining Game of Thrones when you. It's not like a Pied something. Piper thing. Well, it's pretty loud, right? Yeah, it's loud. It's do more we, of a do, signal. Do we want to put one it's in a signal. here? No. <laughs> Shall we? Shall we put in the shofar? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think they've been trying to make the point since the first hearing that these were not random goons who came yes. to DC, right? These were call organized action. extremist groups, and some of these organized extremist groups have now been charged by the federal government with seditious conspiracy, and so now they want to connect Trump and his goons and his co-conspirators in the coup to the people who've been charged with seditious conspiracy. I think that's probably the purpose of well, this. And they really want to get into this meeting that was on December 20th in the 18th, 20th, 18th, 18th. in the White House that featured Sidney Powell, Mike Flynn, and the dude that founded Overstock.com for some reason. Sidney Powell, who was going to be the, he was going to appoint as special counsel. Which was supposed to be about declaring a national security state of emergency. Oh, Wait, God. was that meeting at the White House or was that the one at the Willard? That's the, the one at the, there's one at the White House and one at the, the Willard. Willard. There are these meetings are everywhere. We're gonna get I don't all, know. We're going to get it all. It's all going to unfold right now. You're probably listening to this right before the hearing starts. But yeah, that seems like uh, an important meeting to cover. Yeah. Also, uh, the New York Times reported right before he came in that uh, Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony has led DOJ to start discussing Trump's role more openly in terms of whether he himself organized or committed a crime. Uh, oh, good. What took you so long? Did <laughs> <laughs> they not know where she was? And that it created pressure to look at his criminal culpability, which, yes, my reaction was the same. Like, good but wh why? Why? No, Andrew Andrew Weissman of of the Mueller uh, the Mueller crew wrote in the New York Times today too that that Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony surprised people at the DOJ. They had no idea where that was coming from, and he's like, "That's not a very good sign for DOJ's possible investigation into this." That they were surprised that this Cassidy Hutchinson testimony was out there. Now I do realize that she had this moment where she's like, okay, I said so much, but now I want to say more. I have a new lawyer. We've talked yeah. about this. So she def clearly made a decision to say more, and she went to the January 6th committee before she went to federal prosecutors. But, hey, she was available to federal prosecutors, right? They can subpoena anyone. Yeah. It's, look, I, I, I've said many times on this, on this podcast of ours that uh, um, I don't appreciate Merrick Garland's uh, deliberative pace. <laughs> I, we don't know what's going on inside of DOJ, and it is the kind of thing where the people who know aren't saying very much. Uh, but I worry, I appreciate what they're saying, which is we're starting from the bottom and we're working our way up. And they have gotten to people like Jeffrey Clark, right? He is a s senior person at the Department of Justice. They are moving up. Yeah. But if they're so afraid of seeing political that they're not talking about the mob boss, like it's one thing to say we're going to start with the low level goons and work our way up to the mob boss, but you can't do that if you're afraid to mention the criminality of the mob boss. So it's just I, I just I I hope that they're not af I hope that they're working their way up to something, not afraid of doing something. Yeah, but it seems like it's probably both. Clock's ticking. Who knows? The presenting sponsor of Pod Save America is Simply Safe Home Security. No matter what crazy things are going on in the world, home should feel like the safest place on earth for every family. With Simply Safe's advanced, professionally monitored home security, someone is always looking after your home and family 24 7. Love it. Please tell us about your Simply Safe home security experience. I set up a Simply Safe system all by myself. Now, unlike what a lot of people shared with us over the 4th of July break, it has never captured on video someone uh, setting off fireworks in a stupid way and then sending their whole family running from fireworks exploding in various places. And thank you all for when you first Looping saw that us. video, your first thought was, I got to loop in the Pod Save America. Oh, yeah. Because of the Simply Safe bug in the video footage. Yeah. Um, I appreciate all of you. I do too. Fireworks. You don't You do not do risk reward well, huh, people? You don't do it. Ooh. <laughs> That's the reward. <laughs> and you take and you take a picture. Yeah. Ooh. Cust customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash crooked. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. Go to simplysafe.com slash crooked and make sure you catch your firework explosion on camera. Pod Save America is brought to you by Brooklyn Inn. Brooklyn Inn knows there are fewer things better than falling into a soft, cozy bed at the end of the day. But if you're a hot sleeper, trying to catch some Z's can feel impossible when tossing and turning in warm sheets. Thankfully, Brooklyn and has you covered, literally, <laughs> with their best-selling and award-winning bedding designed with light, breathable fabrics to keep you cool all night long. Brooklyn is the home of the internet's favorite sheets. It was created in 2014 to give customers luxury hotel-level home essentials that don't break the bank. 
They offer everything from snuggly sheets to cozy towels and robes, loungewear, accessories, and much, much more. Whether you sleep hot throughout the summer or year round, like me, I was just sleeping hot last night. It was woke up. I was like, ah, I could use, I could use some cooler sheets. Mm -hmm. My Brooklyn and ones were in the wash. Make your entire bed feel like the cool side of the pillow with Brooklyn and signature crisp, breathable classic percal. Is it percal? Yeah, percal sheets and replace your heavy winter bedding with our lightweight comforters for the ultimate breezy, light as a cloud feel. And since each is crafted with smooth, long staple cotton. You'll be drifting off to sleep in no time while staying chill throughout the night. And if you're not sure where to start, you can shop with ease thanks to Brooklinen's online quiz. Whether you're looking per for the kale. per kale, mm. per kale, per kale, per kale, per kale, whether you're looking for the perfect set of cooling sheets, lightweight towels, or breathable loungewear, their quiz is the best place to find a curated list of high-quality products perfectly suited to your unique preferences. Per kale, per so, kale. <laughs> so, so head over to Brooklyn <laughs> today to keep your cool at home, and then go all summer long. Go to brooklinen.com and use promo code Crooked Media to get twenty dollars off your purchase of a hundred dollars or more in free shipping. That's b r o o k l i n e n dot com and enter promo code Crooked Media for twenty dollars off and free shipping. Pod Save America is brought to you by Cariuma. They're a team of lifelong surfers, skaters, and planet-conscious creatives, which is a phrase that everyone uses, making classic sneakers in a way that's better for you and the planet. What does the great outdoors mean to you? Epic mountain ranges, misty forests, endless beaches. They are as PTO-worthy as they sound. Meet the Aka Low, a classic low-top sneaker made with organic cotton canvas and a natural rubber outsole. Aka will inspire you with its good looks, next-level comfort, and bright summer colors to lace up and get outside this summer. Cariuma's original sneaker boasts tens of thousands of five-star reviews, a roster of stylish celebrity fans, and waitlist over 61,000 names at a time. From day one, the sustainable brand has been doing things differently, from partnering with ethical factories to sourcing low-impact natural materials, even planting two trees in the Brazilian rainforest for every pair sold. I'm wearing a pair right now. I'm wearing a pair right now. How are they feeling? They feel, they feel great. They feel comfy. I got another couple of pairs at home. I'm never going to be out without my Akas. Do you think Jeffrey Clark threw on his Akas when he was uh, run out of his house? I just saw from the... It his looked like feet. it was just his boxers and a button-down. You can't see his down. feet. You can't see his feet. Just he's wearing a button-down and boxer. They didn't let him get sweatpants. Now, mm -hmm. if you're looking for something different, maybe Jeffrey Clark was, uh, but he's looking for the same vegan, recycled, and plant-based DNA. It doesn't sound like the Jeffrey Clark, <laughs> I know. Jeffrey Clark. But anyway, the EB sneaker is going to be for you. With an upper knit from sustainably harvested bamboo and recycled plastics and a sugarcane EVA outsole, EB is the type of shoe to make you forget you're wearing shoes. Of course, Karyuma ships all their sneakers free and fast in the USA and offers worldwide shipping and 60-day free returns. They deliver right to your door using single-box recycled packaging. Now for a limited time, Pod Save America listeners can get an exclusive 15% off your pair of Karyuma sneakers. Go to C-A-R-I-U-M-A dot com slash P-S-A to get 15% off. That's C-A-R-I-U-M-A dot com slash P-S-A for 15% off only for a limited time. President Biden is off to the Middle East after holding a White House event on Monday to tout the first gun violence legislation in 30 years, and an event on Friday where he issued an executive order to help ensure access to abortion medication and emergency contraception. The president also said he's directed his legal and health advisors to determine whether he can declare an abortion-related public health emergency, which could free up more federal resources to protect abortion access. But he also reiterated that the only way to codify the protections of Roe as a national law is by electing a pro-choice Democratic House and two more pro-choice anti-filibuster Democratic senators in November. Biden also got angry during the speech as he described the story of a 10-year-old girl in Ohio who couldn't get an abortion in that state after she had been raped. Just last week, it was reported that a 10-year-old girl was a rape victim in Ohio. 10 years old, raped, six weeks pregnant, already traumatized, was forced to travel to another state Imagine being that little girl. Just, I'm, I'm serious. Just imagine being that little girl. Ten years old. Uh, guys, what did you think of Friday's White House event, both uh, the executive orders and the speech itself? Uh, Tommy, you want to start? I thought, so I thought he did a good job talking about how extreme the Dobbs ruling was and the horrifying human consequences, as that clip, I think, showed. Um, I think he told, did a good job telling a bigger story about the implications of getting rid of the right to privacy generally. That's an important story. That's a bigger piece of this. He, he tried to use the uh, court's words against them where they sort of cynically told women like, oh, this isn't getting rid of abortion. This is just throwing it back to the states. And he said, you know, we all need to vote. Um, and I thought the substance of the EO itself was good. I thought the beginning of the remarks were a little bit confusing. There was sort of like a 
he was almost debating the court's legal analysis and going back to 1860. Um, it was the least visually compelling option that exists to you in the White House. I'm doing parts I liked and parts I didn't like. Mm. Parts I didn't like. I think Biden speaking in front of the VP and the secretary, uh, HHS secretary and some books is not super visually compelling. It's not the most likely way to get on TV and get picked up. I think ideally you get him out into states. You have him talking with people impacted by the ruling as part of your messaging strategy. But, um, you know, it's challenging to get the president out of the White House sometimes, I guess. Yeah, I think I think it was it's the best things he's done since the ruling came down. Uh, and I wish it hadn't taken two weeks to get to a statement as forceful and, uh, you know, combined with an action that uh, seems like it had been in the works for a while. I do think, but I think it was strong. I think he was clearly em emotional and kind of giving people the, I think, some of the intensity that they were looking for over the previous couple of weeks. Uh, there was a there was a an, an aside inside of the speech that I think caught some of the problem I think activists and other politicians have had with the way the White House has responded, which is he said, uh, you know, you have to vote, you have to vote. In the meantime, I'm doing this executive order. And there's something about the framing of it as like in the meantime, kind of diminishing the role the president can play. And I'm not I'm not disagreeing with a lot of the analysis that says that in many ways the the White House is playing like a really shitty hand in the wake of this ruling, but it kind of captures the problem, which is regardless of how how weak some of these levers are, there's a sense that they've been observers over the past couple of weeks and not proactive enough, not just trying things, not not pushing the boundaries of what the president can do. Yeah, you want the cadence to be, I'm going to do this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and then in November, we're going to make sure we yes. do that. You know, it's that kind of... Yes. Now again, back to, to Tommy's point, that's harder to do at the setting of the, of the White House, right? And obviously, you can't just travel to anywhere just on a dime sometimes, but... Um, can at least you know have go to Michigan, go to, where people were right. collecting signatures yeah. to try to get a ballot initiative. Yes. On but ballot. um, yeah. but I, I, it yeah. was good to finally see him angry about the consequences of the decision. Um, while he was telling that story of the ten-year-old girl, you know, I think more of that is necessary. Hopefully, outside outside yeah. the White House. Um, we should also add that the Biden administration today announced that hospitals must provide abortion services if the life of the mother is at risk, and they're arguing that the um that federal law on emergency treatment supersedes any state abortion restrictions. So I'm sure that will get challenged, but that's what HHS came out with today. Very important. Um, the New York Times said that Biden's executive executive orders on Friday uh, stop short of stop far short of demands from abortion rights advocates. Um, what else could Biden do on his own without Congress to protect abortion access at this point? So one step that a lot of groups have been calling for and some in Congress have been calling for is declaring a public health emergency. There's been some there's been some calls for uh, providing abortion access on federal lands, but you see a lot of disagreements even among activists about how about how, if that could work or not, and it might put people in more danger. There really does seem to be a disagreement about I, that. I, I went deep on this and started reading all the the because a bunch of legal experts are uh, publishing op eds about this. It, it looks like. So if the federal government owns federal land in a state where abortion is restricted, the federal government could set up an abortion clinic, right? Um, and ideally, those uh, the abortion providers and the patients could not be prosecuted while they were on that federal land. The second they step off that federal land back into the red state, there could be people just waiting for them to, to arrest them and prosecute them. Now, they could possibly win that legal battle. But I think from the administration standpoint, they're thinking the risk is not to the federal government in doing that. The risk is to, to the provider, the doctor, the patient. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, I think you can argue it both ways. You can say, well, we'll try and someone will have a test case and let's see what happens um, with this court. Of course, you don't have high hopes for that. I mean, the question is, are there jurisdictions where you have a local prosecutor who said, I will not prosecute these cases and then you could figure out a way around well, it. Well, now you way. have to overlap. Where's the federal land right. with ju the jurisdiction? With the, So I think there's not a lot of spaces where all that exists. I, don't, I think there's more, like people sort of talked about this as like, oh, we're going to set, set up a clinic in Yellowstone National Park. Like that's not really what it is. Like DOD owns a ton of land. The VA owns a ton of land. Some of them have healthcare facilities. So I agree with you that it's, you're, you're trying to create a Venn diagram with a lot of overlap and it's complicated, but it's not like I think creating some clinic, a hospital from scratch in the middle of the Rocky Mountains. I think it's, you know, yeah. No, I think, I think it's the the worry is when you step off the, the prosecution yeah. issue is hard. But the other one that I was getting to is the uh, uh, so Nancy Northup, who heads up the Center for Reproductive Rights, said that under a public health emergency declaration by HHS, they could enable out of state prescribing and dispensing of medications for abortion for those in states with abortion bans. 
it does seem like Biden has now said he's considering doing the public health emergency. There's some question of just exactly what it enables, though, and and some concern that it might backfire, though. I trust that a lot of the groups advocating have thought that through as well. And they they want they want the White House to do this. And what I look as you we're not lawyers, mm. uh, but if but we read plenty of takes from them, we read plenty of takes from them. <laughs> but look, if if the amount of mayhem and danger uh, to people who are now having to travel hundreds of miles to access reproductive care. Like if this was caused by anything other than like five vicious little right wing freaks, if it was caused by weather, if it's caused by a storm, if it was caused by a blackout, we'd of course call this a public health emergency. Tens of millions of Americans not having access to basic medical care is a public health emergency. We're just uncomfortable with the fact that it's being 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 uh, uh, put upon us by 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 judges as opposed to some natural disaster. But it is an emergency. This is a, a, a problem in government that has been around for a long time, which is bureaucracy and particularly legal bureaucracy just sort of snuffs out uh, every interesting Creativity. creative yeah. idea. Yeah. <laughs> and and you can and the tell is in some of these stories, it's like there are some in the White House who do think that we should they should do the public health emergency, mm -hmm. that they do think they should do the you know, that they thought about the abortion clinics on federal lands. Right. There's always sort of a debate because some people think maybe it could happen. And then there's a lawyer that tells you that it shouldn't happen for some reason. Or there's a bureaucrat that tells you the, it shouldn't happen. The criticism I had the least time for was don't politicize public health. It's like, I, I'm I, sorry. I that, that. What are you oh, talking I, I, like, about? I skipped right over that one. The one that I thought Why? was more valid was because of the pandemic. And that was a public health emergency. It would only free up like tens of thousands yeah, of dollars no instead of millions. So there's right. no money to free up in the public but health. Public emergency. health has been but it's not, politicized. Which to me was a better argument than the but, fucking politicization thing. But it has to but you have to make the argument about the aspects that aren't just about funding, especially because the federal government's hands are tied on funding because of the Hyde Amendment. So what are the regulatory steps that this opens up? And some of the pushback from people against the public health uh, emergency declaration are saying it only will give the president a few tools. Or only take get, all the tools. Take all the tools. Get all the tools. And the other piece of this too is there's some concern about what the courts will do in response. And I am look, I, I think it is I think it's worth appreciating that this White House has has always just as a as a posture not has moved toward decisions that they think will do the most good and have not been very receptive to kind of signals and kind of big displays that don't actually make a difference. But if your concern is that these things are going to get shut down by the courts at a certain point, let them get shut down. Do things show that show people what the courts are doing to restrict access to abortion. You know, don't worry so much about what some forty year old, two year old Trump appointee, you know, got his law degree in a cereal box is going to do to you. Yeah. Make the case and fight and say, hey, we're losing because of this. This is what this is why we need more senators. This is why we need a, a bigger majority. I think the concern about protecting providers and patients is valid of course, in, in the of legal course. fight. I think the the concern about like. The courts just striking it down and having a loss is just silly for all the reasons right. that you said. Yeah, how does it? How does that end up worse? I don't know. Um, and then the other, on, on that note about courts, you know, the one other thing that Biden hasn't done, of course, is say that it's time for more dramatic court reform, like adding seats, um, which you know I think he should do. I, I believe in that. He doesn't, obviously, but again, if he did that tomorrow, we'd be in the same position we're in right now because you know we don't have anywhere near the votes in Congress for something like that. We don't even have enough votes for getting rid of the filibuster to codify Roe. So that's the other thing. But th that's basically all the different options um, that he has right now. So the Washington Post had a long story over the weekend about how Democrats and activists were pretty upset over how long it took Biden and the White House to get to where basically they ended up at Friday's event. Um, what did you guys think of those critiques? It was pretty fair. I mean, you know, Everyone knew this was coming because of this leaked opinion. I think that a lot of legal experts, if you listen to strict scrutiny or hysteria, you probably knew this was coming a lot longer. Um, and the the Washington Post reported that the White House seemed to think the final opinion would drop on June 30th, but it still took until last Friday to get the executive order out. So I just still don't get why the executive order wasn't ready. Like Biden has obviously dealt a tough hand here, right? He's got this radical court. He's got a, a Senate that won't use its power and get rid of the filibuster. But I don't know. It, it did seem like they were unprepared. The The leak was in May. <laughs> this yeah. was this was the one decision that we had a heads up on <laughs> because and, it was leaked. <laughs> and again, like he has, he's right that he has limited power and, and what he needs is the Congress to pass a law. But 
again, I'd love to have seen him gone to Michigan and get go do an event with uh, Governor Whitmer. You could go to the West Coast. You could do events with Gavin Newsom in California or the governors of Oregon and Washington who are putting together this like West Coast reproductive rights compact to provide services. I mean, it just seems like there wasn't a lot of creativity. You know, I, I even came across an old clip from the primary. It was the sixth debate. Uh, it was a CNN debate. And Kamala Harris was like, hey, we've barely talked about abortion rights at all in six of these debates. And then she made this impassioned case um, about all these anti-abortion laws getting passed in states and the impact they could have. And it seemed really prescient in hindsight. It's like they could have had the vice president out doing much more events. I mean, it just felt like, listen, messaging isn't action. It's not going to fix the problem, but it shows people that you're fighting. The, to go back to the public health emergency analogy for a second, the president can't change the weather, but when terrible disaster strikes, the president goes, he consoles people, he he surveys what happened to the country. Which, by he, the way, this president is quite good at yes. consoling yeah. people. And I think the fact that we're still debating whether or not it's a public health emergency, whether it's worth declaring one this many weeks after the decision was handed down, I think what people are responding to, regardless of whether or not the president has specific power here or there, is please treat this at the at, at the scale of emergency that it is please respect how big of a crisis the country is going to and maybe the more you reflect how big of a crisis this is in how you respond how quickly you get out there how often you're out there how how quickly you're laying out the steps you believe you do have the capacity to take uh doing it immediately in the in the in the hours not weeks after the decision is handed down maybe that also helps change the politics of the moment too that you're not just re you're not that you're helping shape the public response to this event as it unfolds as the disaster that it is. The reason that you know that it was just, uh, it was a fuck up is that they eventually got to on Friday where most activists wanted them to go. So right after the decision was announced, there was a, a, a very viral Twitter thread from AOC where she said Democratic mm -hmm. leaders should be specific and say we need two more pro-choice senators, um, you know, Brian Boitler's been saying that here. Our team at Vote Save America has been saying that. Then, you know, David Pluff said something similar. So all these people said it. Brian's Bi doing his own little insurrection but, but, outside the White House. <laughs> <laughs> Biden, eventually got, Biden eventually gets there, but he gets there three weeks later, two weeks later, right? And so that's how you know. Look, if, if Biden genuinely didn't believe in these things, didn't want to take these actions, didn't think they were possible, that's one thing. They could have made an argument, but they just weren't ready. Like our team at Vote Save America didn't know the day that the decision was coming down. We were ready. <laughs> like they had till May, they had since May to get ready. And this... the, like the fact that they eventually got there is a tell that they just didn't get their shit together in time. Or um, that or that even you know, even in these this piece that was looking at, you know, all the criticism of the delay they report that there were meeting after meeting, thinking through what they right. could do in response. So this may not be up to anyone except Joe Biden himself. Joe Biden himself being slow to make a very important decision that everyone knew he was going to get to. Well, how did you, I mean, how did you not know that the filibuster thing was going to come up, right? And so like, sure enough, three days after the decision, he's in Madrid for a press conference and Biden like blurts out on his own, apparently, and according to the Post, in a conference called with AIDS that he wants to come out for getting rid of the filibuster for this. But I'm like, how is there not a meeting about uh, that no, specific scenario? John, the, the timeline is even more convoluted. They were, he was calling into a meeting from Germany after the decision and then three days later blurted it out in madrid oh, at, at the a madrid press thing. conference yeah, so yeah, sort yeah. of like why would we just sit on this and yeah. then it also puts uh uh the vice president in a bad position because right. she's not getting ahead of yeah. of biden so she goes out there has a terrible interview about this what is it hours daily i don't know the exact timeline but very soon after they actually take that position just looks yeah. looks bad so the White House had quite the response to the Post story. Uh, here's the official statement from communications director Kate Bedingfield. Quote, Joe Biden's goal in responding to Dobbs is not to satisfy some activists who have been consistently out of step with the mainstream of the Democratic Party. It's to deliver help to women who are in danger and assemble a broad-based coalition to defend a woman's right to choose now, just as he assembled such a coalition to win during the 2020 campaign. Where the hell do you think that came from? I mean, listen, I think, first of all, it's important to just say this isn't kate riffing no nope. you know what i mean this wasn't like a tv interview that went badly this was clearly a prepared statement that i'm sure was signed off on by everyone on the senior staff and so yeah i read that i couldn't believe it i mean i tried to put on my like most sympathetic imagine yourself back in that building hat and just i thought about the fact that 
criticism from your friends always hurts more than criticism from your enemies politically. And especially in a case like this where they know like how challenging the situation is. And I'm sure someone said something that the White House felt was unfair. Um, I agree with the sentiment that you need the broadest coalition to solve this problem or frankly any problem. But it's just bad politics to criticize activists that in a couple of weeks you're going to be asking to organize and get fired up and go work for you in the midterms. And I just think it kind of feels like there's this lingering frustration in the Biden White House with the left. And they feel like, well, during the primary, we ignore Twitter and some of the criticism from the left that drove the day-to-day -day news cycle. And that's why we won. And there's probably some truth to that. But you just can't lump the overturning of Roe versus Wade and activism around that seismic event in our history with sort of things that were, in hindsight, maybe silly to focus on during a dem Democratic primary. And you can't both be really slow to put out a plan for what to do in the wake of a decision this big and then yell at the activists who are trying to fill the void, you know? And like Biden is facing some real headwinds right now, especially with young voters. And it's just, it's not, when, when you're on the record quote is potentially the most damaging part of a story like this, it's a really bad setup. Uh, here's, there are, there have been issues where uh, Biden, it's part of, part, part of how he became the nominee where Biden has sort of stood astride the, the, the politics of the moment and refused to go along with the lefties and like made a point of it. This isn't one of those issues. Like this isn't criticism from like an activist left. There's a vast majority of people that are in favor of, of codifying Roe that are pro-choice. Uh, this criticism is broad based. It isn't left, right. It is, it is a, it is, it is. It is coming from most Democrats. But I was going to say, you know, one of those people who's in favor of codifying Roe and getting rid of the filibuster to do it? Joe fucking Biden. Right. <laughs> this yeah. is what, to Tommy's point, like her quote, I, I read that, I read the quote so many times. I was so angry. I, I, I had like rarely been this angry seeing something come from the Biden White House because it's like, that quote, other, the, the whole rest of the story was basically about how like, yeah, the White House was slow, but they got to a good place, right? And, he, they, they, and the president had just gotten to a good place on Friday. We just talked about the speech, you know, little improvements here or there, but finally he got there. He's in the right place. And then because they're so pissed at activists and so angry, they decide to put that statement out, which is not even a true statement, which is like, if, even if you take her argument, like you said, that activists are out of separate the mainstream that are kind of party. Yeah, on some issues, sure. We're some of those activists sometimes. That's fine. Whatever. I'll, I'll I'll point out those issues. But like on this issue, you have the president of the United States just taking the position. Then the president goes out on Sunday and they ask him, uh, what do you have to say to the protesters that are protesting in front of the White House? And Joe Biden says, keep protesting, keep protesting. Yeah. So he tells the protesters to keep protesting. And Kate Bedingfield told the protesters uh, that they're out of step with the mainstream of the Democratic Party. It is the most it, it was one of the worst unforced errors I've ever seen from uh, this White House or any Democratic White House. I could not believe it. I don't under it is actually baffling. It's actually just it's it's baffling, especially because this isn't a moment where you there's any there's nothing to be gained by dividing up. Well, it's the, also the the, the 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 party on this issue. There's just nothing. We to all have to hang together to win this next. I mean, again, and we're it's all the same on the, we're all on the same side in this fight, right? I mean, that's the other half of the quote. He wants to assemble a broad-based coalition. <laughs> it's like, yes, that's exactly the point. So you can't kick the shit out of the left. Like, which activists out of step with what mainstream? Like, what you know that someone was mad about something specific and drew up a quote in a way that just pissed off literally everyone. And like, I, like I, yeah, I felt deeply frustrated because like. I feel like us on this show, we're like always trying to put ourselves in the in the shoes of the people working in the government and how hard it is to actually govern versus campaigning. And like there is, I think, some understandable, but some I think silly frustration with the rejoinder, which is we need to win more seats because we fucking do. <laughs> but when you lash out at activists and then go vote, 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 it feeds into that cynicism with pointing to electoral politics and turnout as part of the solution. And I think that's damaging for all of us here. And again, it's like if you we can talk about specific provisions, specific issues, like if you don't think that abortion clinics on federal lands is a good idea because you're worried about what will happen to providers and patients, like maybe we can disagree on that, but totally understand that that's your view. If Joe Biden just is not there on court reform yet, I disagree with him. I think we should reform the court. And but you know what? That's his position. We'll keep trying to persuade him. 
just saying, oh, you fucking activists are out of step with the party. That That's not the way to do it. That's not the way to make the argument. It'd be one thing if like uh, yeah. there had been a vote. Like if there had been a vote where there had been a a different version of codifying grow that like tried to answer the concerns of like Collins and Murkowski that was more conservative and didn't go far enough. And there was a dissensus amongst the amongst the left. And some Democrats were saying, we're going to sink this thing because it doesn't go far enough. Right. Like you can come up with a scenario where you could have seen some intra left issue being important in this moment that that has not happened. That is not what we are. Yeah, because seeing. Joe Biden signed on to the legislation that doesn't just protect Roe, but uh, would expand Roe. Right. <laughs> so, so her boss is in the wrong i mean i it's it's wild i won't i won't keep going i just i couldn't believe that it happened um one note of optimism before we move on there's another development uh tommy you've been talking about michigan a lot um organizers in michigan announced on monday that they turned in over seven hundred and fifty thousand signatures to get a ballot initiative this november that would enshrine the right to an abortion in the state's constitution uh in order to qualify they needed just over four hundred and twenty five thousand signatures they got seven over seven hundred fifty thousand, which is huge um if you all want to support the campaign in Michigan, uh, as well as the campaign to stop anti-choice ballot measures in Kansas and Kentucky, remember there's a vote in Kansas on August 2nd. That's going to be the first time there's an actual vote uh, on abortion in the states uh, since since Dobbs. Um, you can donate to Vote Save America's Fight Back Fund at votesaveamerica.com slash fight back. All right. When we come back, take appreciators. Pod Save America is brought to you by Keeps. Keeps offers a simple, affordable, stress-free way to keep your hair via convenient virtual doctor consultations and medications delivered straight to your door every three months. You don't have to leave your home. 24-7 care and support. Keeps has got a network of expert medical advisors, prescribers, and care specialists to support you in making your hair goals a reality. It's cheap. Treatment started at just $10 per month. It keeps offers generic versions of the two FDA-approved medications to prevent hair loss. Treatment plans are affordable, typically half the cost of pharmacy prices. Keeps has got everything your hair needs delivered straight to your door with discreet packaging and proven results. Remember, prevention is key. Treatments can take four to six months to see results, so don't wait until then. Don't wait until then. Act fast. When it comes to your hair, save more, spend less. Ladies, fellas, and everyone in between, if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to K-E-E-P-S dot com slash cricket to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash cricket to get your first month free. K-E-E-P-S dot com slash cricket. Pod Save America is brought to you by Stamps.com. When you're running a small business, every second counts. So why are you still taking time out of your day to go to the post office when you could be using Stamps.com instead? Stamps.com makes mailing and shipping quick, easy, and cost-effective. That's why we've used Stamps.com since our early days here at Crooked Media. For more than 20 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. With Stamps.com, you get discounts you can't find anywhere else, like up to 30% off USPS rates and 86% off UPS. Stamps.com seamlessly works with Shopify, Amazon, Etsy, eBay, and more. All you need is your regular computer and printer, no special supplies or equipment. You're up and running in minutes, printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send. We love Stamps.com. Used it forever. Back when uh, we didn't even have that many letters to send or anything to send. Now we send nothing. Now we send all kinds of shit. And guess what? We don't go to the post office because we use stamps.com. And it comes with that free digital scale. Stop wasting time and start saving money when you use stamps.com to mail and ship. Sign up with promo code CROOKED for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter the code CROOKED. Pod Save America is brought to you by Truebill. You'll never guess how much subscription companies charge you every month. On average, nearly $200. It's a lot. Make your subscription submit with Truebill. <laughs> wow. Okay. I didn't see that. That's Make your funny. subscription okay. submit. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 per year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts, and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. Uh, you know, I was asking about this the other day with yeah, Ben Rhodes. Yeah, your co-host. He was like, what's that thing you, we do where we unsubscribe stuff? We gave him the Truebill code. He's making a weekend of it. Yeah, I can see Ben being behind on some cancellations. He's still subscribed to George Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> Truebill has over 2 million users and helped save them over $100 million. Like Matthew B. In a matter of seconds, he saved $660 a year on his direct TV bill. Save $840 a year on car insurance. Don't fall for subscription scams. Ben R. saved $200 on Blob Monthly. <laughs> <laughs> Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash Cricket. Go right now. Truebill.com slash Cricket. It can save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash Cricket. 
All right, we are back with another round of Take Appreciator here to uh, hear our host of Take Appreciator, Chief Take Officer here at Crooked Media, Elijah Cohn, is with us once again. Hey, John, John, Tommy. <laughs> hey, Elijah. How's it going? Good to see you. Hey there. Welcome back to the Take Appreciators. Thanks for having us. I'm going to share some takes with you all. The producers have seen these takes. Uh, you guys have not. Mm -hmm. That's Correct. right. That's Promise. how it works. Promise. You all will react and then rate them on a scale of one to four politicos with four being the worst. Now, we put this together pretty quickly and Andy encouraged me because we don't have an interview today to get have several. So would you guys be willing to go over oh boy. the Why don't we go allocated three? Why don't we go till the exact moment we don't want to go any further? <laughs> Why don't we try that? Okay. I may have to change my order because there's some that I found later that I really, really Okay. Like. Well, do your favorites. Get your favorites out there early because yeah. you don't know when Lovett's going to just cut this thing. Yeah. Yeah, you can't be like Biden and wait two weeks to get to the point, you know? <laughs> I'll take that note to heart, and we'll start with this one. That is an alley -oop for you, love it. Uh, oh. You're tweeting about this piece. I actually put it on my radar in the first place uh, from the New York Times. I know this one. A piece titled, The Far Left and Far Right Agree on One Thing, Women Don't Count. All right. So this piece, in its own words, says that the right has dedicated itself to stripping women of fundamental rights, while the fringe left is also misogynist because of trans-inclusive language. Here's how the piece concludes, quote, whether Trumpist or traditionalist, fringe left activist or academic ideologue, misogynists from both extremes of the political spectrum relish equally the power to shut women up. Huh. Op-ed or like a regular writer for the Times? It's an opinion piece. If you, if you guys want to take a guess about who wrote it. I mean, I think Love and I know who it is. We know who it is. I do not. Uh, Brett Stevens. It sounds like a Brett Stevens. Uh, well, that's interesting that you would say that because this person uh, uh, is has been in, in their past connected to Brett Stevens. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, yes, they were married to Brett Stevens. Uh, and it is, and it, there is, there is a uh, look. This is an unsubstantiated rumor. So uh, the the author of this piece uh, ran, I believe, the New York Times Book Review, and basically, it, there, there, it was thought that it was hard to get your book into the New York Times Book Review if you ever said some shit about Brett Stevens. Oh, oh wow, <laughs> that's good gossip. So it's it's been Paul. said. It's Pamela Paul. It's Pamela I don't Paul. that. I don't. By the way, I don't know that what I just said is true, and I don't care. Because that's not why this piece sucks. First Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's not what the problem is with these columns. This is off the charts false equivalency on this I, one. I, just it's, off the charts in 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 the wake of Dobbs. Just it's truly truly despicable. I, it, it is so like just sort of uh, like know your enemy, know what your threat. Know what if you actually are worried about Trumpists and attacks on women from the right, the idea that you would equate it to uh, language that respects the existence of trans people is obscene. It is ridiculous. It is born Or of... even a debate over that language. It, it's, it's just so crazy. It's like it's, so... It's, it just is... It's, it, it, it is so awful and it just reflects somebody... It reflects a worldview that just doesn't view their own... That just doesn't worry about their own risk right that just doesn't feel threatened by what's happening enough because if you really did internalize how dangerous the right is to women to all of us to trans people to everybody you would never in a million years equate it to recognizing the fact that trans people exist and that we are having an important <laughs> conversation about gender that is long overdue it's just obscene i hate it it's it, the worst comp i've ever seen 15 pinocchios <laughs> 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 okay full yeah full full playbook from um, it has to have the i have to give it the full playbook right, especially right. because it, it was designed it was designed yeah. to no. enrage twitter it was mm. designed I'm, to I'm do what it, it did i'm giving it a full playbook because in in the true way that the take appreciator scale was developed it, it's for someone who just tried really hard to be that annoying that, those are the people who really deserve it and i think i think this her, her next column was about how john roberts should retire oh yeah uh, yeah right. she's just, really she's on just a, she's absolutely on a tear. just she's on a tear. just what a waste of space in a newspaper that column is <laughs> i didn't read it so i'm gonna go for politicos because <laughs> I, I resisted the siren song of being outraged by an idiot great well, on vacation <laughs> yeah we were on <laughs> yes i by the way elijah all right we're, we're enough on this one <laughs> Because I, 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 I was on vacation too when this came out. I saw your rage tweeting. I was rage tweeting on vacation. Yeah, good. 
All right, Tommy. Well, let's see how you react to this idiot. Oh, thank you. This was from a cable news show. It just happened. We need a little bit of background for it. Recently, Judge Brett Kavanaugh went out to eat at Morton's Steakhouse. Yep. Some protesters found out he was there. They went to the restaurant. They never went inside, but Kavanaugh was forced to leave early through the back door. This led to a civility outrage news cycle, one of our favorites here, which included this clip, Charlotte, whenever you're ready. But let me, let's be very clear. None of us and you do not have a First Amendment right to protest judges. You explicitly and specifically do not have that right. So, yes, sir. I mean, you could do it to the view if you want. There's not a specific and uh, I don't want to interrupt their dinner. That, that no. sounds dangerous. But also, they, whatever happened to they're afraid of a return to norms or they wanted a return to norms. But if, the more they do this, the more they just encourage people on the right to respond in kind, which is people on the right typically don't. But and I'm not encouraging that. I, obviously, January 6th is a completely different thing. So don't at me. All right, guys, who's who's going to talk about the return to norms? Who was that? That was Dana Perino, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I recognize the voice. Um, I mean, this is going to have to be a full playbook for me because it's so fundamentally wrong. Appear well, you know what it is? There's something going around. There's been something going around that apparently it is illegal to protest outside judges, Supreme Court justices' homes. There is a law about that. So, so they have twisted that now into there's no First Amendment right to protest when, uh, wherever to a go judge to Morton's. Is. Yeah, right. There's not, yeah. There's no like, um, yeah. There's the Constitution doesn't like cease existing in a 500 radius of these fucking creeps. This one was great because you got a random brand to weigh in with the statement, yeah. <laughs> on constitutional rights and like whenever we can get Morton's involved in some sort of you know like Second Amendment, Third, four, pick an amendment. If you can get a dinner chain to weigh in, I think that's a that's a winning strategy for yeah, terrible I, takes i don't think anyone's also anyone's challenged the law about not protesting outside justice's home and sometimes and i i, I might imagine you'd win that challenge how could law. you you know who's gonna rule on it <laughs> yeah, those true. fucking assholes <laughs> well in 1432 there was a uh, a judge in england who said uh, you actually can't say a bad word to judges or we'll have to hang a gay person why why is this such catnip for cable pun it's like every time their someone's dining experience gets messed up in some way. I'll it's tell you a, why. It's a story. I'll tell you why. In the same way, there are certain people that watch nature videos and they see a cheetah chasing a gazelle and they can only see themselves as the cheetah. They mm. do not recognize themselves in the gazelle. Yeah. They, these are all people that eat at fucking fancy places. It is inconceivable of them to not have access to reproductive care, but they can imagine, imagine their, dinner, di their dinner being disturbed. That is yeah. easy to imagine. Not the back door. He That's couldn't right. go out the front door. He had to go out the back door. Did he have to, did he have to walk by trash too? The poor guy. Poor guy. Maybe, nice. maybe, by the way, for all we know, look, if you've eaten at Morton's, there's many times where you need to leave quickly to get home to a toilet. <laughs> and for all we know, Brett Kavanaugh was desperate to shit after eating a huge and, and really probably delicious but ultimately disgusting meal. And maybe he just needed to get home and those protesters were the cover he needed. Thanks, Elijah. Thanks for including You this. did this. Thanks for doing this. No, I, I also like Morton's. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I give this one uh, three, three. Because she wasn't, try she didn't really, she sort of stumbled into it. She, you know what? I guess. I don't think Dana wow. Perino thinks the First Amendment doesn't apply to judges. <laughs> it's live TV. I don't know how anybody does it. We edit this thing to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't yeah. sound like it, does it? But <laughs> yeah, you'd be amazed. <laughs> you'd be amazed what we don't put out. It certainly doesn't sound like it. I thought the norms talk would, would get you all the way, Joe. That's, that's upsetting to me. I mean, by this point, you know, there's only so much outrage we can muster. Go ahead, give it. Give us another one. Try All right, this again. is more. This I don't know if this one fits the normal take appreciators, but it's just so fun. It's just so outrageous. I had to put it in here. Okay. Um. So it also feels appropriate because today we have the January sixth hearing that's focused on extremist groups like the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers. Come watch the January sixth hearings with us on our group thread, YouTube.com/slash/crookedmedia. Subscribe. This piece was in the Sarasota Herald Tribune. Wow. It was so uh, egregious that they actually removed it today, but screenshots live forever. So here we go. This piece is titled Attacking Proud Boys Does a Disservice to Caring School Parents. Wait, what? <laughs> yes. Again, the what? Proud Boys are an, a violent extremist group. Uh, here's a quote. When I think of the Proud Boys, I think of fathers, business owners, and <laughs> Come veterans. On. 
These fathers have spoken at many school board meetings. They are concerned about the direction of their local schools, and I commend them for coming to school board hearings. Now, does anyone happen to know who wrote this? I do not. I saw this. This is a joke. This is a, this is a joke. Up. This is a parody. No, it's real joke. It does seem like when like the those Russian comedians like crank call people yeah. and get on the phone with like the Secretary of State somehow. It can't be someone that we that we know. Who no, wrote no. This. I, I I I think this falls into the category of it is impossible to tell the difference between extremism and parody without more context because mm. this is such a. a that shit fucking thing. So the author was Hugh Hewitt. The author is some, none of y'all are going to guess her yeah. name. Uh, it was Melissa Rodovich. But the kicker is that she is married to a member of the Proud Boys. Ah. Oh. Well, that explains well, that. that now, sense. there we go. Well, at least they took it down. But it tells, it's quite telling that it went up at all. I mean, you can, you can use the I see them as caring parents excuse with literally any flavor of horrific person <laughs> throughout history yeah it is absolutely true that uh many people who join fascistic right-wing organizations are in other ways considered upstanding members of society that's in part what has made them so dangerous yeah that's um anyway i, I mean th that one's on the op-ed page you that know what i mean a, yeah i don't know what's going on in sarasota there's some ideas that you don't really need to circulate on your platform no. that would be a good one no to not um all right. What do, do we do? We want to do. We want to call it there. Or do we want to, Elijah to do one more? Let's do one more. Let's gonna... your last one. All right. Which one should I pick? I hope it's just a takedown of the James Webb Space Telescope. <laughs> Deep field, God. my ass. Elijah said. There's so many good ones. I, there's the Dan McLaughlin tweet, but I'm going to pass by that because it's just a tweet. But that one was really good. Yeah, we shouldn't. Yeah, no, no one should give baseball crank more uh, more airtime. I think this is a fun one. I could get some debate going here from you guys. It's Ooh. from it's from Politico magazine, so kind of the namesake for the for the segment here. Sure. It is titled "If Tucker Runs in 2024, Here's Who the Democrats Need." <laughs> All right, the, the spoiler: It's John Stewart. Uh, so the piece stipulates that Biden should run again, but if he doesn't, and Tucker does, John Stewart should run. Here's a quote: If Biden doesn't run. Stewart would start with a massive name ID advantage over any Democrat and a vast legion of Daily Show viewers. The show ended six years ago, but Trump's jump from TV to the White House has taught that viewers, even of a declining reality series, can be committed voters. By that measure, Stewart starts off better positioned than anyone else in the Democratic field from the start. Man, that is some impressive brain poison right there. <laughs> I don't hate it. <laughs> I don't hate it. He was he, he he fulfills my number one my my number one rule, which is famous before two thousand ten. Yeah, <laughs> which is true for any streaming service Check or any politician box. who's going to be president. You got to be famous before two thousand ten. Um, look, I'll say what uh, NBC executives uh, said uh, about a lot of uh, comedians in the nineteen nineties. Too big a leap. <laughs> I think that <laughs> that was for Elijah. This person needs to <laughs> look. I love. John Stewart, I love The Daily Show. It was not watched by that many people. Is I what this person I, I think is missing? It was a very niche. Yeah, I, here, thing. I, I like John Stewart too. Um, I think if we're going to run a comedian for president, uh -oh. I think we go with Col Colbert. Oh, uh, there's a Gutfeld. I would, oh. I would want our side. I think <laughs> that's someone. <laughs> Gutfeld, yeah, <laughs> it's Gutfeld. Colbert, someone. It's Gutfeld, everybody. National audience on CBS. Throwing the towel. Of the it's country, Gutfeld. Politically astute. Oh, I'm I'm going for All Colbert. Right. Um, Col yeah, Colbert also hasn't evolved the sort of um, cranky grandpa energy that John Stewart has. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's a, you know. Which I look, I enjoy. I, th I find very funny, I but I think a it's, big fan it's of the challenging show. politically when you need to like talk yeah. to people you don't like. Look, who, wrote, who wrote this? Who wrote this? Is, uh, is this Jack Schaefer? No, Jack Schaefer wouldn't do that. Uh, who's this? I'm trying to think. Who would write this piece? You guys want just want to know? Yeah, I just want to know. I don't know. It's uh, Juliana Glover. Oh, familiar. there you go. Okay. Just, just from from her desk at Cafe, Cafe Milano. Yeah, that's. Um, just, uh, <laughs> I don't know. We'll see the Bill Maher trial balloon soon. I'm sure too. Oh boy, no, brutal. <laughs> brutal. Guess we'll throw that a Politico rating. Put it away. Um, mm, eh, one. I yeah, mean, yeah, one. one. It's, yeah. A, it's, it's a half-hearted. Your troll bores me. <laughs> and again, again, I will just say I agree with the analysis for, uh, on this dais, uh, but but. <laughs> My first reaction was like, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> but I was gonna tell you a second. I let it roll around in my mind for thirty seconds. <laughs> I let it bounce around. This wasn't something that it didn't go. It didn't bounce in and right back out. I let it roll around in there. Just a little, I just let it. I let it. I let it. I let it walk around. I mean, certainly yes. better than a lot of the candy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I look at. Listen, let's, we can we can talk about the list. Put it on. Put him on a bracket. I don't think he's out in the first round. <laughs> This, the piece, the actual piece does have a lot of like, I know this is a terrible idea, but bear with me. And I bared with her and I think it's a pretty good idea. Yeah, you, you know bear, what? You bore with her so long you know that what? here we are talking about it. Zero politicos. It. Zero politicos. <laughs> Zero. Think, oh, wow. Zero politicos. It is simply a take. I think the story forced. <laughs> I think Stuart came out and denied it on Twitter. Denied that it matters. So did, so did Obama. And then some journalist was like, this wasn't Sherman-esque. And really go, oh, oh yeah. I banged my head against okay. the wall. Okay, well. Uh, Elijah, thank you as always for, for the takes. a fantastic round of Take Appreciator. I think we all enjoyed ourselves. Um, Everybody wins. And everyone enjoy the hearing today. And uh, Dan and I will be back on Thursday to talk all about it. Bye, everyone. Uh, we got some fun live shows coming up in Seattle, Portland, Nashville, and Atlanta. And love it or leave it, will be in Chicago this Friday, the 15th. This Friday. This Friday, with guests Ali Barthwell, Abby McEnany, Ashley Ray, and the Gay Men's Chorus. And the Gay Men's... I, I, I said it's Gay Men's Chorus, which I said right the first How'd time. How'd you say it this time? Like I said the Gay Man's Chorus. It's just one man with a chorus. <laughs> <laughs> I think leave it in. <laughs> Great. Uh, get your tickets to these shows at crooked.com slash events and come say hi. Uh, we would love to see you in person. The shows are fun. Yeah, we're in Chicago on Friday. We have an awesome show lined up, so everybody should come through. Also, check out Crooked's newest podcast, Imani's State of Mind, where psychiatrist and TV personality Dr. Imani Walker and co-host comedian Meg Scoop Thomas normalize the conversation about mental health through insightful and witty discussions about what's happening in news, pop culture, and our daily lives. Get real with your relationship with yourself, your parents, your friends, and so much more. There you go. There you go.